Hello and welcome to the Strategies for BDD and Testing Success webinar um, with our very special guest today, Jeff Langer. During the webinar, we're going to be talking um, basically about all things BDD, um, and we're going to be covering in some detail the background and history of BDD, um, how we got to where we are now. Um, BDD as a tool for facilitating conversations and better collaboration. Some of the, the benefits of using BDD um, and how best to achieve those benefits, um, as well as the pitfalls and challenges that come along with implementing BDD as uh, a development approach and how to include it as part of your broader testing strategy. Um, after we've done all of that, we will have some time for questions and answers, and that'll be your opportunity to address any specific issues you might have in relation to your own DDD journey, um, or just to follow up on any of the points that you heard during the webinar. Just by way of some housekeeping announcements, we'll be keeping everybody on mute throughout the entire webinar. Um, so if you do have any questions or comments, please feel free to share them in the chat room and we will pick them up if we can during the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Um, we're aiming uh, for somewhere between 45 and 60 minutes. Um, so please, uh, please stick around um, if you're able to, to do so. Um, if for some reason you do need to, to drop off or if you have colleagues that weren't able to, to make it onto the webinar for whatever reason, we are recording it. Um, and we will share it with you via our blog um, as soon as the, uh, the video has been processed. Um, just so you know who I am, uh, my name is Simon Knight. I'm the Test Rail Product Manager. So if you've got any Test Rail related issues, questions, or suggestions about how we can improve your Test Rail experience, you know who to reach out to. Um, before I became the Test Rail Product Manager, I spent 10 years or so working mainly as an independent software testing consultant, um, working with teams of all shapes, sizes, and uh, in various geographies to help them deliver better software, faster, and with less bugs. Some of you may also know me from my work with the Ministry of Testing, where I hosted the first few Test Bash conferences and helped produce some of the training for their testing dojo. If you want to stay in touch, you can do that via the socials on the Gurup blog or on my own personal blog. As I mentioned, joining us today, we have our very special guest, Jeff Langer. So on the, the slide there, Jeff has been around for quite a while. He's had a, a 30 year plus um, career in software development, um, developing and delivering software, primarily using agile approaches and subsequently teaching others to do the same via his company, Langer Software Solutions Incorporated. In addition to his busy development, coaching, and training uh, schedule, Jeff has somehow found the time to write and contribute to a number of books, including Uncle Bob's Clean Code. Um, and he's also on the technical advisory board for the Pragmatic Bookshelf. Jeff, welcome to the, the webinar. Did I miss anything else? No, I think that's good. Thank you for having me, Simon. Uh, since I live in Colorado Springs, I'm actually in Oklahoma City at a customer site where they're gracious enough to loan me a conference room to sit and chat in. Awesome. Well, we're very grateful to them for, for that. Um, Jeff, uh, what, what were your motivations for, for doing this, uh, this webinar? We're very grateful to, to have you here. Um, what are you getting out of it? Um, first off, I, I just love software development and any opportunity to share things that I learn as I work in teams. Uh, I kind of bounce back and forth between development and consulting. So it, it's fun for me to go out and help others come up with the speed on things that I might have picked up in the, uh, my trials and travails of trying to get this stuff right. Uh, I've done BDD or BDD-ish things for probably since around 2000 where I found out about extreme programming and its notion of acceptance tester and development. And over the years, I just got to work in a lot of teams where we tried it as well as work with customers 
who are trying to do uh, BDD and having some struggles with it. I got all sorts of cool stories from doing it. And usually a cool story means uh, lots of ways not to do it. So over the years, hopefully I've winnowed down all the ways that are going to cause challenges and gotten to a smaller focal set of uh, ideas for how to make BDD best work for your team. Awesome. Uh, I, mean, I, for one, am um, very much looking forward to, uh, to hearing what you have to say. Um, certainly over my time, um, over the course of my testing career, um, I've championed the, uh, the use of DDD on the, the teams that I've worked with. Um, but I'm, I'm pretty sure um, I've suffered from some of the, uh, the confusions um, around what BDD actually is and how it's intended to, to be used um, over that time. So, yeah, looking, looking forward to, to hearing what you have to, to say and maybe um, setting me and the, uh, the, all of our attendees straight on some of those points. Um, so we're going to get started. Just um, as we do so, um, we're going to... We're going to do a, a quick straw poll via the uh, the GoToWebinar control panel, um, just to uh, just to help us get an understanding of um, where you folks that are joining us on the call um, are at on your BDD journey. So that's going to be shared now. Um, please please do go into the the console and um, answer that. So yeah, there it is. Just come up on my screen. Uh, See how to uh, how to get back to the, the presentation now. Oh, not that one. Okay, so while you guys are answering that, I am going to transfer control to Jeff, and then we can uh, we can get started. Oh, bear with me. Having a few technical issues. Okay. All right. There Are we seeing my screen now? Sorry. Oh, there we go. Yes. Take a second to come in. How's that poll looking? The poll is looking like we've got um, just over half of the audience not currently practicing DDD, um, around 40% just getting started, and um, quite a, a tiny 4% with, uh, with lots of experience. Is that, is that about the, uh, the split you were expecting, Jeff? Um, that's, that's kind of a surprise to me, to be honest. And it sounds right. I mean, there's a lot of folks wanting to ramp up on this. Uh, I, I think the mix works well for this uh, seminar here. So yeah, I, a lot of this is, you know, again, experiential-based stuff on how to really get started, how to think about BDD as a practice that can work. And uh, that's the crux of it. But along the way, I've got a few stories for the folks who have been doing this a while, and maybe some of you have short stories that you can share as well. All right, so we good to go? All uh, right, yes, we are. Okay, so I'll ask you a question quickly, Simon. If uh, the whole term user story has been bandied about in agile shops for many, many years, and what's fascinating is the different takes I get on what a user story is if I ask them for a quiz, quick definition. So what would you characterize as a user story? Um, so uh, in my time working as a, a tester with teams, I'm think of as, as kind of classically agile sort of format. So um, as, a, as a person using the, the system, say an administrator, um, I want to do a certain thing um, so that I can achieve some kind of a, uh, an objective. So as an example, as an administrator, I want to control um, user access to my system so that I can um, meet some security requirements. Fantastic. Okay, so that sounds great as a starting point, and that's probably the classic form that many folks had learned how to express user stories in. Um, I think I want to harken back to when I first heard about user stories, and so we're talking like late 1999, uh, 2000 or so. It was this notion that the business is coming in and saying, well, we want this stuff built, so let me tell you a story about it. 
Uh, so it is a story in this very classic sense of people describing things to one another. And an oral story, I'm not going to write it down up front and say, well, here's all the detailed requirements, which is what we used to talk about. And you're going to go read it and hopefully interpret correctly and build things. Um, and as such, it's, it's a story. Well, to be a successful story, it can't be this one way thing. It has to be a conversation. So the business tells us something as a development team to build. Uh, and when I say development team, I include everybody involved, which would also be testers and BA folk and so on. And our job is to come back with the appropriate questions or counter uh, negotiations, if you will, around what needs to go in this thing that you want built. Ron Jeffries always used to say a story is a promise for a conversation. And, and that was the best way to think about it. We would start an iteration or sprint. Business would come in and tell us, here's what we'd like. We'd start with a brief conversation at some kind of a planning meeting. But through the course of the iteration is where we would start to flesh out more and more detail to the point where we actually had some software ready to show and say, OK, is this really what you want or not? So it's this conversation, I think. And I think that's the best way to think about it, and less as it's this notion of a requirement stated in a slightly different way. Um, and it comes into play when you start to look at things, let's say six months from now. Hey, Jeff, uh, what's in the system? Uh, what does the system do in this case for this feature? And my answer was often, I don't know, let me go look. Uh, well, I can look at the JIRA where maybe we've captured all our stories or uh, maybe a Gurok testing tool where we've overviewed the kind of test scenarios we might apply to it to start to get a sense. But the problem was um, if the notion of a story is this conversation we had six months prior, my gosh, how much of the detail are you missing out of what you've recorded in JIRA or in uh, any other tool? So I think that was always a big problem. Um, so I want to step back even further. Now we're just going way back in time. I, I'm curious, have folks ever worked with use cases? And I don't know if that's a quick poll we could put up, but use cases were a thing back in the 90s where the premise was, hey, maybe we learn how to describe the system as a set of goals acted on by users in the system with some sort of a narrative about how the system should behave. So I do this, the system responds with some result. Based on that result, I as a user do something else and so on back and forth, the system does something. Uh, and that was a really nice idea, but it kind of fell apart when it came to throwing things over the wall. Uh, so the premise was, hey, we take these use cases, send them over to a development team, and they'll build what we ask for. And from you know, historical perspective, it really didn't hold up. It, we had all sorts of ambiguity. People would misinterpret things. I remember one case where I was working with a customer with an offshore team. They sent a use case offshore, had it come back a few weeks later, and the business analyst and product owner are saying, well, that's not quite what we were asking for. Go back to the coding board and fix it. And that went back and forth again. Uh, a few days later, they built something to hopefully correct the problem. A total of six times before they finally understood what the business was asking for and built uh, the right thing. So I think that's the challenge we face. So along comes uh, the notion that maybe there is a way to uh, come to consensus without this kind of ambiguity. And I'll jump into the next slide at this point. Um, this is where the notion of BDD comes into play. You'll see three hats on the screen. You might have heard of this thing called the Three Amigos. Uh, um, to me, Three Amigos are really people playing roles in a development team. And classically, we've div divvied those up between the business or some representative of the business, the developers or programmers, and then the testing interest, the people who are there to make sure that what we build has quality. And the idea is we all get together before we go off and build it sit down, come to consensus on what it is we should build, and put that in, phrase that in a form that hopefully is less ambiguous. And I'll show you what that looks like in a moment. Simon, any thoughts on this so far? So if I'm, I'm a user story is a, a placeholder for a conversation um, that is, is going to take place. So it's, it's um, to use Ron Jeffrey's words, I think you uh, you mentioned it's a promise that that conversation is actually going to is going to happen at some point. Right. 
Yeah, he actually used this thing called the three C's. He would call it card conversation confirmation. So the story was just this vague notion of, hey, we need something to calculate missile trajectories, to use an example that someone actually did back in the 90s. Uh, we have this simple notion, and we scribble it on a card to remind us what the conversation is supposed to be out about. Uh, so during the iteration was this conversation that we would hold. So that's the second C. And then finally, sure. to make sure we actually built what the customer was looking for, we needed some form of confirmation, a way of demonstrating that we did actually build what the business was asking for. So just And just uh, underlying yeah. your point uh, about the, the use cases not really working, the problem with those use cases was that that conversation presumably wasn't wasn't happening. Well, I think we had the conversations, but the notion was that maybe we should try to capture all this in an English written or you know other language written document and then have the team interpret it at maybe separate points in time. The thing I think with BDD that's the big distinction is we're looking for the whole team really to engage in front of our attempt to try to build toward what the business asked for. Uh, and that's an essential part of it. You, bring, you think about what people bring to the table, obviously the product owner and proxies such as BAs should know what it is the business needs for the marketplace. But the developers bring a perspective about what's already in the system and they bring a perspective of about what are we missing here? What are some of the little interesting edge cases that could occur, scenarios yeah. that we want to think about? And the testers bring their expertise in terms of how to verify or build quality in from the get-go. So they're going to help in terms of how do we design uh, this kind of a specification that we want to put in play. Yeah. It's, to me, it's, I think the best way to think about BDD, a lot of folks will look at it and say, well, this is a way to produce a bunch of automated tests. To me, that's a great byproduct that you can get out of doing BDD, but the real honest value is in collaboration between the whole team, getting together, getting everybody onto the same page so we're building exactly what we should be building. Yeah, agree. So with that in mind, maybe I should move on. Um, we talked about use cases, and I think one of the problems with them was they were kind of this generalized description of things. So the system should do this kind of behavior, like we want to self-scan purchases. Where BDD starts to take things is in the direction of using actual examples of behavior. And I think this is something folks learn a lot more easily from. Behavior uh, Examples are a lot easier to understand than some sort of a generalized specification document. So this screen actually shows an example that you might see in a typical shop doing some form of behavior-driven development. Uh, there are some many, many tools that will support it. This is an example showing one such tool called Cucumber. And we'll come back and talk a little bit about the tools later. Uh, to me, the real emphasis is not the tool, though. Again, it's about how do we express things to make sure we're in agreement. Uh, so this feature sitting here is around self-scan purchases. And the first part of this just explains the rationale behind the feature. We want to be able to reduce consumer weight, let them scan their own items for purchase. Um, there's some level of background which just sets the stage for what is already in place. What's the state of our system that we're trying to uh, look at describing? And then you have a number of scenarios. And each scenario is maybe one way to think about it is as a test case, or it's an example of a test case. So for the self-scan purchases feature, I have one scenario that says, okay, someone has a credit card and they want to self-purchase a single item. What does that look like? If you did use cases, this probably looks very similar. It's this notion of given that I'm a shopper, I've scanned some item with some description smelt, uh, and then I've said somehow that I want to complete the scanning, finally supplying a valid credit card, then the system does something in response. So this smacks yeah. a lot of what we used to see in use cases. But the yeah. one first distinction is it's an example. It is not this vague, or I'm sorry, gener generified description of the feature. And what you see as a result, the expectation or the verification or assertion point in this uh, scenario is that the system prints a receipt with the following lines. So if the, all those interactions have taken place, our final outcome should be we can see a receipt with the item smelt on it plus a total for that. Uh, so you can start to get a sense of maybe we can start to extrapolate different scenarios. What happens if the scanned item is not recognized? What happens if the purchaser wants to void a scanned item and so on? And so part of our goal is to sit through and think of, you know, in terms of behavioral interaction with the system, what are all the ways that a person using it, an actor or user, might do things? The nice yeah, thing, what, so the first, 
Go ahead. Sorry, uh, I was going to uh, going to say one one of the um, one of the things that I found helpful, um, and I can't remember where I got it from. I think I may have read it in a, a blog or something at some stage. Is um, is thinking about expressing having having kind of state based um, considerations in in mind when I'm expressing these scenarios. So, in effect, given a, a starting state, when I change the state, then I see this new. States. And I, I always kind of have that in the in the back of my mind when I'm when I'm writing these. Is that helpful? Do you think? I think so. I mean, essentially, it is a kind of a two-person state here. It's a, a user doing something, and then the system reacting with things in their state. So, it is to me. It's more. I think I always tried it. Well, they call them narratives in use case development. So I don't think that's a bad term for it. It is really though this interaction I think that we're trying to describe here and representing in a way that pretty much anybody can come and look at this document here. This feature description on self-scan purchases and know immediately what the, what is this feature all about and how does it play out in terms of specific scenarios. Yeah. Um, it, it another, does form another another way that I've heard these referred to or you know sort of conceptually is you're expressing a relationship with the, the system. Yeah, I think so. I think that's a great way of expressing it. So yeah. the first beauty of this is it uses a kind of a simpler uh, standardized form. So if you see people doing this, you'll see them wordsmith and make sure that things are expressed in our agreed upon common domain language for one. For two, there is a very specific format to these documents. And then you have this uh, phrasing, this given the shopper has done something, when they do something that we're trying to verify, then we can do some level of verification. You'll hear people often refer this to as the given when then way of expression, expressing an interest in how the system should behave. So that consistency plays a lot towards making this a nice, readable, maintainable document over time uh, for anyone to pick up and say, yep, I get it, I understand this feature. So that's one huge benefit that comes out of it. The other thing that you can start to do Unlike with use cases, uh, with if you're doing BDD in this manner, you can automate these tests. Huh. It's interesting. So the feature uh, name, the self-scan purchase, is just pretty much freeform text. Um, the rationale is freeform text. But if you start getting into this background section and the scenario section, pretty much every line in here ties to some underlying code, what we call glue code. Real thin layer of code, and the purpose of that glue code is to tie into your real system and drive it. So given that the shopper scanned the item smelt, we actually find code behind the scenes or the tool finds code behind the scenes to say, okay, interact with this system. Maybe it's through an API. Maybe it's by driving its user interface with a robot. One way or another, we drive the system and tell it to effectively do whatever operations it needs to scan an item with that description. When it comes down to verifying, then the system prints a receipt we actually can say, all right, to the underlying system, go give us a, a receipt uh, or a representation in text that will be on that receipt and then compare it to what's in the test here. So every line in here is automatable because we also because we do this in a consistent manager manner, which means that what we do get out of this as well as the documentation and understanding ability is this notion for every one of these to act as automated tests, which is really cool. You don't have very to go cool there. I've indeed. actually worked with customers. Go ahead. Uh, very cool indeed. Yeah, we've had, I, I've worked with customers where they were unable to automate a good chunk of these sorts of things. And what I, I initially I was disappointed because we tried and had some technical issues. This was many years ago. Um, so we kind of gave up and I felt really bad. But uh, the BAs came back and said, no, no, this is fantastic because it really solves our bigger problem of making sure we're all in concert about what it is we should be building. There's a lot of little nuances that's fairly easy to yep. get wrong. If you can automate this, the other cool thing is basically you know that how this feature description describes the self-scan purchase in this example is accurate. It is what we call living documentation. So it doesn't go stale because it either passes the test or fails it. If it fails it, we know it's not an accurate depiction of what's happening in the system. If it passes, we know we can trust this as correctly what the system does. Yep. And um, speaking from the uh, the perspective of, of a product owner, that's, that's incredibly valuable. 
um, knowing that your the, the documentation that you have on your your system that you're developing is uh, is either up to date or it's not, and knowing it's not because your tests uh, are failing as a result. Right. Uh, so I'll go quickly through a, a number of slides and then get to some interesting stories about some challenges that folks have with this. And this first one is just to suggest that hey, maybe you're doing test-driven development, maybe not. But in the course of building out a feature, BDD is a simple cycle. We're going to sit down as a whole team, this whole three amigos sense of business development test, all getting together to talk about and agree on what we're going to build. We're going to devise a set of scenarios that accurately de describes examples for a feature and hopefully ultimately start to automate this. Well, that's the test. It starts out as a failing test because we haven't built that feature yet. At that point, we go into our development cycle, whatever that is. It might involve TDD, which is a very similar cycle down at the programmatic level where the programmers will write a failing test for some small, small uh, minute portion or unit of the overall behavior and then work on getting that passing as well as cleaning up the system as they go. So I, I kind of think it's interesting to look at these as basically two embedded site or two, uh, what's the word, uh, two cycles where BDD leads into one smaller cycle that's repeated. And then once the programmer has a sense that they've gotten all their smaller bits of development accurate and all their tests are passing, in theory, at that point, the behavioral test at the BDD layer should all be passing, and then we know that we should be able to ship this product. So this this reminds me a, a little bit, Jeff, of like a, a continuous delivery pipeline or a, a continuous integration kind of a approach. It, are we talking about the, the same thing or is something slightly different? I think it's a critical element to a continuous pipeline approach. And we'll have a, I have a slide a little later about some companies that have actually done this. But the theory is if you start to build tests that essentially describe all little programmatic units as well as all higher level interests of behavior, plus bolster it with some other kinds of tests, and we can also talk a bit about that, where they fit into this, um, the theory is that maybe we can, as people make changes to the code, have it go through a process where it just runs all these tests automatically and then push a yeah. button and say, okay, that's gone to production. And there are teams actually doing this. And that, I think, is the ultimate goal. It's certainly you not feasible in all places, but I think it's where we went ahead. You preempted my uh, my question there, Jeff, which was going to be, yeah, where, where would um, different styles of, uh, of tests fit into, uh, fit into this cycle, so performance, security, stuff like that. But it sounds like you're going to address that later. Yes, sir. We'll hit that in a bit. Cool. So let's bounce through a few more slides. I just have a number of slides that kind of talk quickly about some of the benefits I've already alluded to. And I think one other important thing that I find if I'm trying to work with a team and help them embrace uh, something like BDD, learn it, ramp up on it, and learn how to do it well, the first thing we have to talk about is where do we hope to get with this? What are some of the benefits that a tool like BDD or TDD can provide? And if that's the case, they start practicing and I depart at some point, they need to keep looking at that and saying, well, are we reaching these goals or are we not? Uh, Jeff claims that, for example, we can get this benefit of a nice way to test out of this, but maybe we're having some challenges with that. And to me, it's always a good hint that if you're not, if there's a promise of benefit, other people are able to achieve this, and we're not getting it, maybe we need to sit back and think twice uh, about what we're doing, talk to someone else and figure out why this is not getting us to the goal we're lo looking for. So I, I don't know what you would call this goal-driven or benefits-driven uh, guidelines on how to do things. One of the first ones is this notion of specification and continual refinement. A story is an evolving thing. The business is going to change their mind as they go. So we start with some examples and we shape them over time uh, as we learn about the marketplace, as we learn about what really works in the system versus what was troublesome. Uh, all sorts of new things come up and cause us to change how the details should behave. So this is a, hopefully a continually evolving set uh, feature descriptions and scenarios in the system. And it does hint that these are things that you have to maintain. Uh, it is not free to do this. You have to spend the effort to um, maintain these examples and keep them up to snuff and make sure that everybody on the team agrees that this is the right way to express things. 
Um, but that's another reason to look for more than one benefit, which might be, let's say, you know, a lot of folks look at this as saying, hey, I'm going to get test testability out of this in the notion I've got some level of regression. I don't think that's enough. I think you have to seek these other benefits to really return on your investment in BDD. So that's one. We continually refine things uh, through conversations around the examples in BDD. I've already mentioned that these things can provide wonderful living documents. They don't go stale because they're running all the time. The thing I always tell people to do is when you're starting to work with the system, always try to use the test as your entry point rather than dive into the code. If you're a programmer, uh, we typically just tend to want to go right to the code. Hey, no, take a look back and say, what, what's in the system currently? How does it behave currently? Let's read through the test and make sure that they jibe with what the system expresses. We are continually negotiating uh, between all parties at all times, between those three hats and as well other folks, uh, stakeholders and so on. So I also view BDD as kind of the center of a negotiation process. Um, I don't like to use the word contract too often, but uh, I think that is one good way to start viewing these BDD tests. Uh, where I've seen this process work best is where a product owner kind of comes in and essentially takes ownership and says, well, this is what I want. Here's all the examples. You're going to help me build them out, and when I see them, I'm going to sign off on them or not. But this is our central agreement as to what it is we're going to build. And once you get it to pass, I'll accept that as a product owner. We used to call these acceptance tests uh, because they were mostly tests at that point. But BDD said, well, let's, let's take that one step further, make it a process of agreement or negotiation that produces these tests. Do you, do you have a, a view, Jeff, as to how long that process should should take? Normally, and I guess it's it's you know dependent to, to some extent um, upon the the size of um, the the feature that, that you're working on the, the system um, and a number of other factors. But um, I mean, the the team is uh, is typically under quite a, a lot of pressure to to actually get stuff delivered. Um, so they, they, there might be some temptation to, to kind of skim on the amount of work to, to really um, drive down to the, the, the necessary level of detail to, to get those things documented as, as BDDs. I mean, how, how long do you see this kind of stuff taking normally? Uh, I think it's a good question. I kind of heard two things in there I want to touch on. One I'll touch on later, which is how does this fit in the context of a typical iterative process or sprint yeah. scrum, scrum based process? The other one is you kind of hinted at the fact that any kind of thing we add to what's already on everybody's plate or desk is going to be viewed with suspicion. And I think uh, the other reason I use this benefits driven justification for, for doing BDD. I have to work with everybody on that team and get them to buy into what values are going to bring me as an individual or me as a role, not just what values are going to provide to my company, my team, or my company. That's great. But if I don't see a personal value in doing this, I'm going to view it as kind of a nuisance, and which uh, means I'll probably do it not as well as I should. And maybe we're going to miss out on things because of that. So I have to sell this to everybody. In other words, if I'm coming in to work with a team that's embarking on BDD. And I do believe firmly that there is value to each and every person in there. Now, the, obviously, the product owner is the primary person who's going to get the most benefit out of this. Uh, but I think there are some other aspects to it. So let me punch through the slides, and I think we're going to get to all these points. Uh, one mm -hmm. of these is it's probably the best route I've seen to get people all to work together as a collaborative team and come to coherence about uh, what it is we're building, how we're working on things. And I've seen, seen that work even better in places where you have the whole team co-located in the same room. What we want, and to kind of answer your other question, Simon, is a continual communication. We don't want the product owner off in another office or another building um, where we can't ask questions constantly throughout the, our day-to-day -day development work. It's really nice when everybody is in the same place, co-located, and able to converse over details and flesh them out as we build things. That is, by and large, the most effective. And I think the Agile Manifesto says so. I mean, most effective means of uh, communication is face-to-face. So the more we can do that, the more we come up with a team that truly does know how to work together and cohere around things. 
one other thing that often comes up when I work with teams is one of the off, I've actually had one entire engagement where this was their big question. How do we slice apart these really big stories? They're taking more than a sprint. What are we going to do about it? And we talk a lot about vertical slicing uh, as opposed to horizontal slicing, which is a tendency. But I think the tests, there are scenarios that you come up with in BDD can start to help define this notion of what's the scope of things. And I'll go into a little more detail on this later too. But I might come up with 10 different scenarios for that self-scanner, like what if the customer avoids thing? Well, maybe for this sprint, we don't need to worry about that. Let's consider ourselves with this half of the scenarios that we're confident we can tackle in the next couple of weeks and then uh, come back and consider the more interesting scenarios that we do eventually have to cover. But now we have a really nice slicing point to say, uh, what's a clean division across the sprint boundary? One other thing I've been always challenged with as a programmer myself is knowing when I'm done. And I'm sure anybody who's been in this role, uh, I've sat in my cube saying, okay, I think I'm done with my work. Let me go find a business analyst person. Uh, and if you're that business analyst person, you kind of find these uh, as interruptions, I suspect. But the question I have is, okay, um, am I done or not? Is this what you were asking for? Um, ask the product owner that question as well. And the answer is, well, often, well, not quite. That's not exactly what I meant. So there's a lot of times we have this back and forth, much as I talked about in my offshoring story. So the beauty of having these examples that we all agreed on is, as programmers, once we get those tests all passed, we know we're done. We know we can move on to the next thing without necessarily getting uh, this physically in front of someone else who can take a look at it. And they often don't have the time. They're off somewhere else. We can't find them. So often I've seen this begin to block teams and start to waste considerable amounts of time waiting for that kind of a feedback loop to work effectively. So this is one benefit for the developers. It answers this continual question of, are we there yet or are we done yet? Throughout a sprint uh, or iteration, a lot of folks use burn down, but I actually find the amount of tests that are working and running as a really good measure of progress. So we start with a given time period with a whole pile of scenarios to build, they're all failing. As we go through the sprint, our focus should start to be a lot around what can we actually finish to the point where we know it is working and theoretically ready to ship. So we start looking at a number of scenarios passing throughout the sprint out of the ones that were introduced. That sprint is a really good measure of truly where are we are on any given day in the sprint. So that can be another nice measure that benefits the team as a whole. There are I'll a lot of companies off. out there. Go ahead, Simon. Um, I was, uh, that, that graph that you just showed would be like a, a subset of your um, entire suite of tests, I guess, would it? Um, because I, I guess there's a, a chance as you, um, as you continue development that the number of tests um, you have in play, as it were, um, would be going down as well as up because you'd be wanting to, to prune um, some of some of your now redundant tests as, as you go along that. Right, that's a really good point. So, you know, this is a simplistic graph and depending on what you're up to in a given sprint, uh, I probably would lay this out a little differently. So I think you're also making a really good point that alludes to the fact that this is a continual game of grooming. To succeed with BDD, you have to look at this set of tests or scenarios that you build examples as your document or record of how the system behaves. With a new iteration and a whole pile of new stories, you're not necessarily adding new tests every time. Often you're going back and saying, well, how did I change the behavior of many of these other examples that already exist in the system? Exactly. So yes, this is yeah. a kind of a, a mix and match at times. So it's not always this nice little neat set of lines here. We kind of have to go out and figure out what is our range of things that we're gonna impact throughout this sprint. But you think about all those other tests, they should have already been passing. So this is a good measure out of all the new scenarios that we must introduce, what's our progress yeah. on those. Yeah. There are folks that are shipping to production. I don't know, I think I've heard that Amazon does it thousands of times per day, uh, which is just outrageous. But all these companies here have stories to tell and I've got links at the bottom of my slide somewhere that talk about how they use continuous delivery to ship to their customers changes in a very, very rapid and dramatic uh, basis. And to me, it's 
the only way to do that is to have a process like this that does help you build tests as a byproduct to say you know, we have high confidence that we could push this out into production at any given moment in time. You know, obviously defects are going to creep through, uh, and that's inevitable. But the other beauty of continuous delivery is we have a defect. If we can find out about it quickly enough, we can have it fixed about as quickly as we got it out there in the first place. So if we're shipping, let's say, five times a day, you know, maybe uh, worst cases, we've got a few hours of defects. But it, it's certainly possible with this kind of a process to build a pipeline that says at any given moment, someone makes a change to the software, let's ship it into production. Again, it might not be applicable to you and your team, but I think that's the goal we should all push toward, this notion of being able to ship things, listen to the marketplace, and then change directions on a dime. Yeah. Those, uh, those links that you mentioned, Jeff, I've shared those in the, uh, in the chat, and we'll make sure they get added to the, uh, the blog with the, uh, the video when we publish it as well. Fantastic. I haven't checked the links in a while. I hope they're all still active. Let me know if they're not. Well so the, these are tests, uh, and as such, this is Grace Hopper's little bug card from the 50s. That's the first actual bug there, the moth in the relay. These are tests. They are a byproduct, and that's the way I kind of view it, as a part of doing behavior-driven development. They come about as part of being able to negotiate to a bunch of examples that we've expressed in a very consistent manner. We can automate them. We don't have to, but that becomes a really wonderful thing. And I've worked with teams where they've gotten their defects down to Oh, one of them was 15 defects in the first year of production on a 100,000 line system, and that's very impressive. Uh, so that's uh, you know yet maybe the final benefit that you could claim you can get out of BDD. There's probably more. We asked earlier, Simon, I think you asked earlier about the other kinds of tests out there. That's correct. So yeah. What did you What did you specifically want to know? Uh. Well, yeah, I mean, um, so having uh, a little bit of performance testing uh, experience myself, it's not unreasonable that I might want to um, express uh, a performance requirement um, in a, a, a given when then kind of scenario, right? So um, given um, I have uh, 100 um, concurrent users on the system, um, when they carry out, you know, some actions on my system, then I should see um, response times um, yeah, that don't exceed, you know, five five seconds um, for for a page load, or you know, something something along those lines. Um, is is that is that something that that you see in the the field very often? People um, implementing performance tests as um, in 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 a using the, the sort of BDD approach um, and yeah I guess what about some of some of the other kind of tests security accessibility stuff like that how how do those fit in right and I actually have seen teams try to do this under under the umbrella of the primary tool they've chosen whether it's Cucumber uh, and I think earlier I was alluding to the fact that what you saw on the screen was an example written using one form of tool and it happens to be the most predominantly used one. Uh, this given when thing is given when then thing is a language called Gherkin, and it's pretty standardized across a, a lot of tools. But there are other routes. There are tools like Fitness, which expresses things in a very table-driven form, which I think appeals to business analyst folks. But that's all great for functional. You know, what do we do? What do we do? And it's a great question about how does performance testing fit into things. Um, there's, sometimes I'll use the term FERPS which stands for, I think, Functional Usability, Reliability, Performance, and Supportability. So this is another way to characterize the categories of other kind of tests we absolutely need to be running if we want to ship production quality software. And I think maybe using a tool like Cucumber doesn't necessarily have to embody those kinds of tests, and there's no reason that it can't. In other words, if you can shape it in a form that seems natural to express in a tool like Cucumber, go for it. I wouldn't say force fit it though. To me, I think uh, in general, BDD isn't necessarily going to change the other kinds of tests you write. But one thing I think it will do is open your eyes to the fact that maybe we can push a lot of these tests to the front of development. And I think this is one thing that truly appeals to the testers I've worked with. They really love the fact that they are part of the process in front to define 
design and help build out these tests as opposed to, oh, hey, here's your two weeks at the end of development that you're getting. Well, wait, no, it's not two weeks. We lost a few days. So now it's seven. No, wait, it's five days. Uh, testers uh, classically always got their time shrunk in terms of how much time they could spend doing tests. So I think this BDD mentality says, let's push a lot of this to the front and use the test to drive development as opposed to an afterthought about, well, maybe we should check out uh, you know, what we built for quality. Yeah, I, I guess it pertains to, uh, to, to the point you made earlier, which is that you should, it, it should facilitate the, the conversation um, around those things. Right. So uh, let's see, I, I mean, as such, I always bring up the slide that says, what we're doing in BDD is not testing per se. I still contend it's kind of a byproduct of the BDD process that we get some tests out of it. We are driving the development of thing, things. Testing in the classical sense is this afterthought that we're there to kind of explore what was built and really try to shake it out and think of all sorts of things that uh, explore into where might, be, might it be a problem. And, and you think about that and by definition, it, it basically says, it's impossible. You can't test fully exhaustively test a system for anything. So it is a process that we have to go through to make choices about what's uh, best to look at. So one of the things I like about BDD is it says, well, first and foremost, we should be able to pin down all the agreements about functionally what we're building up front of a process. Uh, if we do that, and if we start to automate those tests, it, I think at the tail end, it frees up after the software has been built, it frees up a lot of time for the testers to bring in their expertise and start doing things like exploratory testing, which I can guarantee most people don't have enough time to do in their environment. Uh, this, this is where I think some of the critical bugs can be shaken out that are not normally uncovered, you know, different weird scenarios, looking at the environmental conditions and so on, all the things that impact and create fun little defects in production that are, are nightmares for us. So uh, I think the BDD process helps drive that uh, more availability of interesting testing at the tail end of things. So just a couple stories and then I think we'll get to some questions. Yes, you can have too many tests. I worked with one customer in an insurance company and the QA woman was very proud. They had 4,000 tests that they had built through a pseudo BDD process. And I thought, wow, that seems like quite a bit. Uh, typical systems that I've seen, which let's call them medium-sized systems for lack of a better term, maybe a few hundred thousand lines of code, it, you're going to probably see a few hundred acceptance tests, maybe three, five, seven hundred or somewhere around there. And those might run in anywhere from you know 20 minutes to a couple hours or more. The test in this company took, oh my God, it was 4,000 tests. <laughs> which is just nuts. And they took six minutes on average to run. So I'm trying to do, remember the mental math. It was an outrageous number of hours. You probably don't want to do the math because it's it's almost obscene. Uh, it basically, they ended up getting all these tests to run overnight by scaling it to about 25 machines. And it was still taking 11 hours at night to run, which, okay, wow. That's a lot of tests running. And they would come in in the morning and find that invariably, some percentage of the tests that failed, maybe 20 tests or so. So they'd have to go back and say, well, why did this fail? Well, maybe it was a timing issue. The kinds of tests they had written were fairly brittle. So they had to sift through and basically babysit this whole process to figure out what went wrong. Uh, so it took even more time. I mean, in addition to the initial investment, they had to spend more money to go through and take a look at these tests because they weren't always telling the honest truth about what the system was up to. So why did this happen? Um, First off, they were writing tests that drove the user interface. And I think uh, this is a good point to segue to this testing triangle picture, which hopefully all of you have seen, many of you have seen. If you haven't, Google for testing triangle, and you'll see pictures very similar to this. And what you'll notice is the UI tests are near the top of this pyramid, meaning that we probably shouldn't be writing a whole lot of them. We probably shouldn't be writing a whole lot of them because uh, many reasons. They're slow. They are brittle. Things change rapidly and break lots of tests fairly quickly, and it's just more pain to maintain them. And uh, you know, it's just you don't want a lot of those sorts of tests. Uh, the best tests that we can write for uh, 
a BDD process would uh, probably be better characterized as acceptance tests, meaning they describe features so that a customer can understand them, and hopefully they hook into our system through some level of APIs. So they're kind of a different client than a GUI that we want to look at. As you go further down the triangle, I won't belabor too much of the triangle. Hopefully, we've got other kinds of tests that support things that maybe give us a little more feedback. So if you look at unit testing on the bottom, you've got tests that you can actually write thousands of these to give you feedback in a few seconds. And I've seen that, and that's how some of these teams got to be successful. You've got some level of integration tests which start to say, given that we have this sub piece of the system or subsystem, Let's verify that it actually interacts with its world correctly. Does it talk to the database correctly? Does it talk to external services correctly? And so on. Those kinds of tests are nice, but they are harder to maintain because they're dealing with the changing world around them. So my take is uh, let's shrink that layer. Anything that maybe is better stated as an isolated unit test with just little tiny bits of logic, we push down into the unit layer. And then anything that might be elevated, uh, we push up to the level of acceptance test and we consider, hey, is this something that the customer will want to see to give them confidence that we're building toward their needs? Then finally, at the top here, you have these tests that drive the UI. Now, technically, acceptance tests can be UI tests, but I think the main point is I probably want no more than, uh, I don't know, a few dozen, oops, sorry about that, maybe a couple dozen of these because they break, they're very slow. And in the case of this one company, it was taking them many, many, many hours to run through all the tests. So that was one interesting thing about this customer. The other facet of why they had 4,000 tests was they were basically introducing new tests in every iteration without going back and grooming their backlog. So to me, backlog rather, uh, that's not the right word, a suite of tests. I want to view the suite of tests much as my backlog. In other words, I do want to constantly groom this and update it, as I mentioned before. So they weren't going back, and they would introduce a new story that said something. That we want to see a field on the screen on this page. And so they would write a test that said, all right, create a, a policy. This was insurance. Navigate to this page and verify that you see that field on screen. Never mind how that field contributed to some real end goal of a user. Well, so what should have happened is they should have gone into the system and said, well, where does this fit in? What is the true scenario that we want to express? Uh, viewing a field on screen is rarely an end goal of a user. I mean, so it is, but in a system that deals with insurance, more often than not, it had some impact on the policy that was getting generated. So their better venture would have been to say, go update an existing test or two. Yeah, it's a it's a trap that's very easy to to fall into though, isn't it? Of just creating more and more scenarios for for each feature that you implement. Right, which I think is all the more reason we want to make sure we always look at our tests as the entry point to understanding. The more that people read these on a daily, regular basis, the more likely they are to say, "Oh, hey, I know where this new feature is going to fit." I know where it goes. I kind of get a sense of how the existing feature works by reading this. And now I have a, a good sense of how to update and maintain that. Yep. So uh, all the more reason that all parties need to be regularly looking at these things. And I think it, it to me, it also uh, puts out one of my key points here, which is you know, watch for these signs. Go back to your set of benefits. If this process starts to feel more and more painful every sprint that you carry it forward, maybe we're doing something wrong. I always think it's amusing. I think about this customer with 4,000 tests, and maybe they should have said, huh, hey, we started out, we wrote a pilot test, and they were taking an hour. Now they're taking, wow, six hours, eight hours, and they're running overnight. Maybe we should think about that, because it looks like with the way we're growing this system, that eventually would be a problem. What can we do? What are we doing wrong? Uh, well, maybe we need to consolidate some of these things and look at updating tests rather than creating new ones. Um, hell, well, now it's taking 16 hours, and the only way we're going to get this to run overnight is to scale it across two machines. Oh, uh, well, maybe we're doing something wrong. And I, I just find it amusing that they got to the point, well, not amusing, but you know, unfortunately, they got to the point where it took 25 uh, servers and 11 hours each to get the test run. Uh, and they started inventing little helpers to do things like rerun tests when they failed overnight and so on. So there was this huge investment and all along, you kind of think maybe we should retrospect on things like this and stop doing something that just seems to be heading us down a rat hole. 
Yeah, I love the uh, the metaphor of the uh, the boiling frog in the uh, in the picture because uh, yeah, if if you were that frog, and uh, at what point would you uh, would you realise that you're you know you're you're boiling to death? Then um, it's uh, it's a, it's a critical thing, isn't it, to uh, to, to um, you know stop and and think about what you're doing and ask yourself whether whether there's a there's a better way. Of, uh, of going about what you're trying to achieve on a, right. a regular basis. Right, and I bring up this story about customers uh, test driving the user interface because it is so typical. And in fact, if you go out and search for Cucumber and examples of tests, the ones I find primarily drive a user interface. And I find it very unfortunate that people are setting out this as a good way to proceed. In other words, if you build out your whole system and you have your test drive the user interface, you will certainly get into these kind of nightmares with maintaining it. Their tests will take forever and you're gonna spend a lot more to keep this up to date. And I think ultimately you're gonna find that this pra uh, doing it this way is not returning on your investment as much as it should. In fact, it may be even costing more than it's paying off. So don't do that. Uh, maybe you're forced into it, but I'd say the better answer is to find a way to slice at it uh, at a different layer. You know, can we talk to it through an HTTP layer at least? Uh, do we have a nice clean API? Uh, and the thing to think about is if you actually build a system from day one with a process like this, uh, with a BDD process, and look to automate it, you would probably, well, you would design it in a way that made it easily testable in that manner. If you have an existing system, it's another matter. You have to come back and find a way to hook into it. But again, remember that the key part of this is not necessarily testing that comes out of it. It's the agreement about what the system does and what it should do. Yeah. All right, uh, last little bit is around uh, you know this notion, Gherkin is a really powerful thing. Uh, people can very quickly slam out lots of these little scenarios. And here's an example that uh, relates to a library system. Um, to me, BDD is a just-in-time kind of thing. In other words, what I don't want to do is all sorts of level of over-specification upfront, uh, what we used to call big upfront design in the system. So here you're seeing a number of scenarios. And I think uh, the caveat is, don't spend a lot of time detailing the given when then, but it may be the first thing we can do is start to consider, let's at least agree on a happy path example. Um, you know, check-ins and check-outs. I wanna know fundamentally, what does it mean to check out a book? So maybe I have a scenario that says, okay, if I check out one material and I return on this date, uh, what should hold true about it? And everybody can, from there on out, get a sense of how do we interact with the system to accomplish that. Uh, but from there on out, there's going to be all sorts of interesting alternate scenarios. Uh, what happens when someone tries to check out the book twice? What happens if the book that uh, they check out, um, well, it, someone else checked it out um, and so on. So there's all these sorts of interesting things that can come up. So I think rather than go down the detailing of the given when then or the narrative of each of these scenarios, we can usually imagine that. And so maybe the better sense is let's explore a list of scenarios first. So I'll come back and say, you know, I'll come back to this slide. If we start looking at, here's a list of scenarios. Um, I've got some interesting ones on this slide that say things like, okay, what, what about fines? We wanna start accruing fines on it. Well, that's great. Let's add it to the list of scenarios that we have to consider when we're dealing with book checkouts. But maybe this is now our negotiation point around what is it we're going to tackle this sprint. Now, fines is great, but maybe I've decided that it's not gonna fit this sprint. So uh, instead of the five green scenarios that we decided to tackle, we pare it down to the first three. So uh, coming back to the notion of BDD as a negotiation tool, I think this is uh, you, focusing on the scenarios, iterating them first is a really big list of here's all the possible things we might worry want to worry about with respect to this feature. That's the place to start. Don't start with detailing every last example. I kind of think that's just a waste of time. It doesn't fit with this uh, just-in-time mentality. So on this prior slide, I'll undo the animation. The key here is, it is a just-in-time process. We're going to get together as a whole team somewhere in advance of the iteration in which we hope to present things, and maybe that's way at the start of the project, just to start talking about what do these things mean at a high level. As we get closer to the sprint, we're hopefully getting together again to talk about let's to, to flesh out a list of scenarios plus a happy path example for uh, one of these. 
And then even as we've done that, we get into the sprint, and this is a continual thing. We're having discussions day in, day out, and hopefully we're reflecting those discussions back into updating the test on hand. Uh, so BDD should really be viewed as a just-in-time process where we don't want to sit down and exhaustively detail everything up front. All right, so if I kind of summarize this up, I've got three core takeaways uh, for folks, and one is this is a collaboration mechanism. It's not a, if you view it as a testing tool, I think uh, maybe start thinking about it more as a collaboration mechanism to kind of open up to some of the other really cool benefits you can get out of it. Second, make sure as you go with anything, we, you sit and reflect and say, uh, yeah, this isn't quite returning all the things that Jeff promised it might be able to. Maybe we're doing something wrong. And then finally, view it as a just-in-time process. Uh, let's do, uh, let's not delve into deep into details until we really need to do so. Simon? All right, yeah, I've taken control back of the, the screen, Jeff, so you don't need to worry about that. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so uh, thank you, Jeff, for um, sharing those insights with us. We're, we are at the 60-minute uh, the mark, um, so we'll, uh, we'll squeeze in a, a couple of questions. Um, but I think we probably will need to keep those relatively brief. Um, I picked up uh, a few interesting ones from the um, the console as we were going along. So, uh, Jeff, I think you probably answered this during the uh, the webinar. But just to just to reiterate, who do you think should be writing DDDs? And that's from uh, Atik Cameron, testers, uh, product owner, BE, BAs, uh, the client. Um, I mean, based on what you said, I I would. Uh, imagine the answer is everybody. You know, if you're if you're doing a, a three amigos approach, then everybody should be involved in writing the the BDD. Yeah, I think that's the primary answer. But what it, it's going to depend on your team. Every team's got kind of different makeup in terms of who kind of does what and what kind of sway they hold. Uh, where I've seen this work best is with a product owner who's willing to get a little dirty. Maybe they're not necessarily initially the ones typing this up, but they're coming and sitting and working very closely with other folks. Uh, QA, I think, is typically, if they're involved in the team, you know, typically, often they're in a separate group. If we can get them to sit regularly with other folks uh, day in, day out, it often starts with them. They're the ones that will sit down and have the best knowledge about thinking in terms of what are all the cases we need to consider. Uh, and what are the kind of edge cases that could come up and so on. So often it is them taking the primary goal of starting things. But I, I think you're right. I mean, the more we can get in a room and just put this up on a screen and start working through it as we talk, uh, the better off we'll be. But that doesn't say you, can, you can't work in other modes. And those other modes are typically you know, some combination of BA slash product owner as well as QA working tightly together to start to flesh these out. Uh, but I would say I would also be careful of uninvolving folks. Uh, I've had fo uh, teams come up and say, well, what if we just sent one representative from each team to this? And I'm like, well, that's fine, but maybe try it with the whole team first. Try to get everybody in the room and do this for at least a couple sprints and see how you feel about it. And ultimately, you might find that maybe not everybody needs to be there all the time. But I do think you're going to find that the different perspectives bring really important things to the table when it comes to pinning down the examples. Programmers will think of things that, uh, you know, oh, hey, the system doesn't work that way. Uh, hey, what happens if we can get an exception in this case because of uh, some other subsystem? How do we deal with that? And that maybe represents a new scenario. And of course, the testers similarly bring a perspective about some of the things that the product owner might not be worrying about uh, all the system level interests that we need to concern. Sounds good. Um, you mentioned uh, a couple of tools uh, during the, uh, the webinar, Jeff. So you mentioned Cucumber. Um, you also talked a little bit about um, fitness. Um, from uh, Madhav Shulk, uh, I hope I'm saying that right, uh, are there any other preferable tools that, that can be used for DDD? Um, those are the primary ones in place. So if with Cucumber, you're going to see implementations for virtually every language, and it might be called by a different name elsewhere. There's a spec flow, I think, for .NET. Um, uh -huh. So that's the one I, that's in use in most places. And Fitness comes a, a distant second. But there are plenty of other tools out there. 
Um, honestly, I've seen so many, I'm not even going to go through a list of them. What's interesting about this is back in 2000, when we started with this notion of acceptance test driven development, we essentially, there were none of these available. So we built our own and we found that it's really not too hard to come up with a tool that kind of met well, almost a domain specific language that meshed well with the system that we were trying to drive. Uh, so Google it, and I think you'll come up with piles of tools. But you know, if you're looking at what most companies are doing when they're practicing TDD, I would probably guess that 90% of Agile teams are using Cucumber that do BDD, and the other 10% might be using Fitness or some other tool, maybe even more than 90% on Cucumber. Got it. Uh, so just to uh, just to finish off the the Q and A's with them, there's um, there's a couple of questions around how do you do BDD in test rail. Um, so there's one or two from uh, Sean Penn, and there may be some others in there um, that I didn't see. So I mean, bearing in mind what what Jeff has been uh, in talking about in the, the webinar, that BDD is you know a, a collaboration tool um, that's intended to, to facilitate um, a discussion. Um, I mean, there are a number of ways that, that BD, uh, TestRail can handle uh, storing those uh, those BDD stories and, and scenarios. Um, you can design yourself um, specific BDD style templates for your project um, if you want to. And I like the fact there's some UI scripts um, developed within the, uh, the TestRail community to, to handle, you know, um, formatting, coloring, highlighting of your um, scenarios and stuff like that. So I'll be sure to um, add some links to those things um, in the uh, in the blog when that gets uh, when that gets published. Um, so and we'll uh, we'll try and address um, some of the other questions in the blog post also. So um, I think at this point um, I've got to say again uh, a big thank you to uh, Jeff for uh, joining us. For the webinar, um, it, it, it was really uh, it was really great to uh, to listen to you today, Jeff. Um, and I'm definitely going to be taking away uh, a lot of those insights and uh, looking to implement them um, on my own team, etc. So thanks again. Um, you're speaking at the Mile High Agile event in May, I believe. Yeah, and it's actually a workshop where I'm going to sit with the uh, folks in the seminar session and. We're going to do some exercises around taking some stories, breaking them down into uh, scenarios, uh, and see how that goes. Okay, awesome. So if you're in Denver, is that, the, is that, is that where it's taking, taking place? That is in Denver, correct. Denver, okay, great. So if, you, if you're in the area, um, try to get along and hear Jeff speak. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, you can find me on the, the socials, LinkedIn, or the Gurok or my own personal blog. Um, feel free to reach out if you've got any um, test rail related questions, suggestions, issues, etc. Um, please do go and grab the um, Ultimate Guide to BDD and Testing ebook. I think we've already shared it um, via the GoToWebinar control panel. Um, in the handouts area. Also, you can go and download that from the uh, link on the slide there. Um, and while you're there, you know, consider trying out TestRail for, for free um, if you're not already using it. Um, big thank you to everybody who joined the call. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the webinar has been recorded. We'll upload it to the blog um, along with all of the links and the other stuff that, that we've mentioned during the, uh, the webinar. Um, Jeff, thanks again for, for speaking today. Um, and thank you all for attending. See you at the next one. Thanks for having me, Simon. And thanks, everyone, for listening. Thank you.